Hi, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, me again. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and please join me in welcoming our webcast viewers as well. My name is Nikki Holland. I'm a director at the Canadian Club of Toronto. Viewers, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Our club continues to offer a forum for leaders, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas with us. We offer access to dynamic political business and, and public figures, like the Minister of Municipal Affairs, uh, who's here today. Before I formally introduce him, here's a quick snapshot of our upcoming events. On Tuesday, October 31st, it's not only Halloween, but also Sandra Perry will be joining us. She's a former speechwriter to President Barack Obama, and she'll take our podium. On Monday, November 6th, we will host a dynamic panel on the future of corporate governance. We have some leading board executives ready to shine a light on the issues of our future. To order your tickets or learn more about the club, please visit our website at canadianclub.org. You can also join the conversation via Twitter and Instagram by following us at CDNCLUBTO or by using that hashtag. I want to express special thanks today to our sponsors, the Carpenters District Council of Ontario, represented by Mike York, and the Ontario Real Estate Association, represented here by Tim Hudak. Thank you for your generous support. I also want to acknowledge the youth and young leaders who are here with us today. Uh, the Carpenters Union sponsored the Monk School of Global Affairs, and York University is here today sponsored by the Home Builders Association, the Ontario Home Builders Association. And now our guest speaker. Municipal growth is all around us. Traveling through Ontario, many municipalities, you can see the acres of land being transformed into residential spaces, transportation routes, and retail complexes. Recently, the provincial government has introduced initiatives designed to reform land use planning and to manage growth. The changes are designed to strengthen community voices and enhance, and enhance municipal partnerships. The Honorable Bill Morrow, Minister of Municipal Affairs, oversees a ministry that administers the province's building code and offers support to municipalities on a wide range of programs and services. The minister is familiar with municipal affairs issues. The Thunder Bay Atacokan MPP, who has served in the Ontario legislature for 14 years, has held a number of ministerial portfolios. These include natural resources and forestry and municipal affairs and housing. Actively engaged in his local community, the former property manager was also a Thunder Bay City Council member and a board member at Thunder Bay Hydro before entering provincial politics in 2003. Minister Morrow, the Canadian Club of Toronto's podium is yours. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, usually I throw in a couple of Toronto Maple Leaf jokes. We can't do that anymore. They're awesome. They are spectacular. It's going to be a good 10 years uh, for the Leaf fans. Uh, and really excited to be here today because I found out yesterday that Tim Hudak has to thank me at the end of my speech. Otherwise, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it or not. But when I found out Tim had to thank me, I thought, I'm in. It's going to be a blast. Uh, thanks to the sponsors and everyone who's in attendance tonight. Really appreciate it. And, and as I said, uh, I have some staff here if you're looking to have a chance to chat as well. I think we've got an opportunity to hang around for a little while uh, when the speech concludes. Deputy is here as well, along with some of her staff. Uh, so again, great to be with you all. Uh, is Jillian here? She's not. I didn't think I'd I met Jillian. Nikki is the new Jillian for the day. So I'm pleased to join you uh, today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about steps Ontario's government is taking to make sure we're on the best path to grow this great region. The Greater Golden Horseshoe is one of the most dynamic and fastest growing regions in North America. In many ways, it is Ontario's economic engine. Widely recognized for its highly educated workforce and for communities that are uniquely diverse and multicultural, a highly educated workforce combined with economic and social diversity is central to what generates the region's economic power. 
and will be even more important as we compete globally in an increasingly knowledge-based economy. Diversity and opportunity are what makes this region a destination of choice for people relocating from across the country and around the world. Every day, people are building a greater future for themselves here, for their families, for their communities, and for future generations. Our government has a vision to ensure this prosperity and growth continue for generations to come. And we believe the best path forward is sustainable growth. We believe the right approach to growth will make the region stronger. Sustainable growth supports economic prosperity, protects the environment, and helps communities achieve a high quality of life. Last week, Google unveiled a bold plan to begin planning a neighborhood on 800 acres of waterfront land here in Toronto, designed as a model for urban life in the 21st century. They described this community as an embodiment of the city of the future, a technological test bed for other communities around the world, the world's first neighborhood built from the internet up. Transportation would be prioritized around walking, cycling, and shared electric vehicles. There would be more flexibility to allow for a blend of land use for residential, commercial, and other uses. In many, way, many ways, Google's announcement has put the topic of land use planning at the forefront of our minds and of our imaginations. And while land use planning may not be the top of mind as we go about our daily lives, it shapes the world that we live in today and the world that we want to live in tomorrow. Our neighborhoods, our streets, our downtowns, our homes, and our parks, even our natural areas and agricultural lands. Land use planning is critical to defining how communities grow and what they become. My ministry is responsible for provincial land use planning policy that applies to Ontario's communities. In turn, municipalities lead local land use planning within this framework. Sir Patrick Geddes, an influential town planner in the late 19th and 20th centuries, saw cities as evolving and growing organically. Geddes pointed to the clear and complex relationships between humans and the environment and encouraged regional planning models that would be responsible or responsive to these conditions. And Daniel Burnham, the great urban planner who designed Chicago in the early 1900s, once famously said, make no small plans. They have no magic to stir one's blood. But as the 20th century marched on, we began growing in the wrong direction. Times and circumstances had changed. What we once believed to be a sound approach began to yield results we had not hoped for. There were those who sounded the alarm earlier. But by the end of the 20th century, it was clear that the approach to growth adopted by many North American cities in the post-war era had come at a cost. Low-density suburban sprawl was unable to support efficient transit systems. Sprawl led to clogged roadways that delayed the movement of people and goods, and it required vast amounts of expensive and inefficient infrastructure. Sprawl had reduced the vitality of downtowns and degraded our natural environment, undermining our air and water quality. Natural areas and agricultural lands were being paved over or swallowed up for other uses. It was an approach to development that inspired Joni Mitchell's Big Yellow Taxi. I'm sure many of you know the lyrics. Much of the greater Golden Horseshoe's post-war growth was in the low-density, car-dependent suburbs. Between 1971 and 2006, the region's urban footprint more than doubled. By the end of that period, the cost of low-density growth was becoming increasingly clear. It was time to reimagine our approach to land use planning in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, and we did. Today, our vision is clear. We want Ontario communities that are healthy, livable, and sustainable, that attract jobs and investment and develop vibrant urban centers, where urban sprawl is curbed, where agricultural lands, woodlands, and wetlands are protected and preserved. We need complete communities with more options for living, working, learning, shopping, and playing that reduce traffic gridlock by providing more transportation options, that provide housing options to meet the needs of people at any age, that are resilient and help mitigate the effects of climate change, and that provide convenient access to jobs, services, and housing. This approach promotes long-term economic growth that is sustainable and attracts more investment. As I said earlier, and this is important to repeat, the Ontario we plan and build today will determine the communities that we live in tomorrow and for years to come. 
We need to do our part to get this right. The Greenbelt Plan created in 2005 and the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe created in 2006 were both updated and strengthened by our government earlier this year. Along with the Niagara Escarpment Plan and the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan, these four plans work together to help us remedy the syndromes of the post-war era's approach to growth. The Greenbelt Plan, together with the Niagara Escarpment Plan and the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Plan, identify where urbanization should not occur. Known collectively as the Greenbelt Plans, they provide permanent protection for our agricultural land base and important ecological and hydrological features. Today, these plans provide an overarching strategy that direct how and where we will grow and what needs to be protected for current and future generations. Today, I want to focus on one of our updated plans, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The Greater Golden Horseshoe is a great place to be, producing more than 25% of our national GDP. Our significant ecologically sensitive and scenic landscapes are protected by provincial policies and we have some of Canada's most important and productive farmland. As I mentioned, this economic powerhouse is attracting talent from around the globe. You probably have seen the numbers. Another four million people will live here by 2041. Our population in this region alone will reach 13.5 million people, and our economy will support 6.5 million jobs. That puts us ahead of most major cities in North America. Every year, the Greater Golden Horseshoe gains approximately 120,000 people. That's the size of the community that I come from. By 2041, the region will have grown by approximately 50%. The demand for new infrastructure, the challenges for existing infrastructure, and the pressure on the region's natural environment will be significant. We need to make sure this growth is sustainable environmentally, fiscally, economically, and in terms of quality of life. If we're going to do that, we'll need to be smarter about how we grow. If we truly are to be competitive in the global economy, our region needs to show that we get it, that we collectively have our act together, and that means all levels of government and the private sector as well, that we're planning smart and we're planning for people. Smart growth requires that we make more efficient use of land and infrastructure. We need to direct that growth to areas where it makes sense, especially along transit corridors. Smart growth is what the growth plan is all about. Ontario is in the midst of making the largest infrastructure investment in our history. In schools, hospitals, public transit, roads and bridges. As we speak, 2,500 key projects are underway across the province, part of $190 billion in planned investments. These investments are expected to support 125,000 jobs per year on average. Getting land use planning right will boost the return on these investments. Since land use planning and infrastructure decisions work better together, the updated growth plan supports this. It requires that municipal land use planning and infrastructure planning are integrated. That includes accounting for the long-term costs of infrastructure investments. The growth plan also calls for increased density and intensification. The new targets, which will be implemented through updated official plans by our municipalities, will provide the densities needed to better support new transit and other infrastructure investments. When it comes to density, bigger isn't always better. Dumping all your density into a few locations might not make sense if it requires extremely expensive infrastructure upgrades and if it leads your other infrastructure assets underutilized. Growing smarter is about making the most efficient use of new and existing infrastructure. And it's about growing in a way that's consistent with a high quality of life. The growth plan sets macro targets for municipalities for density and intensification and some site-specific targets in places like urban growth centers and major transit station areas. But our government also provides flexibility regarding how municipalities achieve those targets so they can achieve the plan's goal in a way that makes sense for their communities. In some locations, that will mean high rises, but in other circumstances, it could mean more missing middle housing like row housing, towns, stacked towns, and mid-rise. These new density and intensification targets will also help us build complete communities. 
Complete communities are more compact forms of growth. They are walkable and transit supportive. Complete communities are about planning to provide a more convenient access to a mix of jobs, local and public services, and a full range of housing to accommodate a range of incomes and household sizes. Well-planned complete communities are a more, more sustainable approach to growth. They can create vibrant neighbourhoods that provide a high quality of life that's key to attracting people to the region to live, work, play, visit and start a business. The growth plan also provides a foundation for a strong regional economy. It encourages municipalities to think strategically and long term about lands for employment and how they can be successful, well-functioning places. In the growth plan, employment areas are given strong protections to ensure the lands business and industries need will be available when and where we need them, both now and in the future. In the updated plan, these employment areas now have stronger protection from conversion to other uses. Some jobs can stay within our communities with easy access, to, so, so jobs, I apologize, can stay within our communities with easy access to transit and transportation corridors. The growth plan also encourages municipalities to integrate economic development with land use development to ensure they plan places that are attractive to employers. The plan also encourages municipalities to collaborate on economic development and transportation to support regionally significant employment areas like the economic mega zone around Pearson Airport that crosses municipal boundaries. And the plan calls for major office and institutional development to be located in areas with frequent transit so commuters have more choices to get to work. When they implement the growth plan, municipalities need to develop an employment strategy. That includes identifying opportunities for intensification of employment areas and supporting active transportation like cycling or walking. Planning for job growth more strategically helps optimize infrastructure investments. It directs development incentives effectively and it creates the type of urban development employers are looking for. The growth plan also protects our irreplaceable agricultural lands. These lands support over 200 different crops, meats and other products in the region. And they provide us with food security. Together with the agri-food network, these lands form the region's agricultural system and strengthen the region's status as one of North America's largest food processing areas. Ontario should take pride in the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. The team behind this plan received the top award of the American Planning Association in 2007. That plan, the Daniel Burnham Award, is the most pre prestigious planning award in the United States. And our growth plan team was the first recipient from outside the U.S. to receive this high honour. Many U.S. jurisdictions, like Ontario, are revitalizing cities and economic regions using innovative land use planning practices. That Ontario received this honour tells us we're leaders in land use planning. In the New York City tri-state area, the Regional Plan Association has led efforts to shape that area's development and has grappled with the same issues that we have. Housing affordability, reducing flood vulnerability, preserving open space and increasing transit and active transportation. Los Angeles has a general plan framework that directs growth to mixed boulevards and regional centers connected by transit. And Chicago's region is guided by GO2 2040, a comprehensive long-range plan with 12 priority recommendations that echo themes in our growth plan. These are just a few examples. What makes our growth plan different is that it is backed by provincial legislation. It's the law. My staff tell me that when they speak about the growth plan to their American colleagues, they tell us how lucky we are to have a system like ours and how they wish they had something similar. The growth plan has also received an award for planning excellence from the Canadian Institute of Planners in the reurbanization category, and the Leonard Gertler Award of Distinction from the Ontario Professional Planners Institute. But we aren't resting on our laurels. In May, our government completed a comprehensive and coordinated multi-year review of the growth plan, along with the three Greenbelt plans. That review included a report from an expert advisory panel chaired by former Toronto Mayor David Crombie, several rounds of public consultation, and feedback from literally thousands of people. That feedback and the lessons we learned from the first 10 years of the plan's existence have resulted in updated plans that provide stronger direction to create complete communities, protect employment lands, encourage municipalities to plan better for a rapidly changing economy, integrate land use planning and infrastructure planning, 
curb sprawl and protect our natural areas, water, and agricultural resources, and address climate change. The updated growth plan came into effect on, on July 1st of this year. We still have a lot of work ahead of us. I mentioned earlier that municipalities lead local planning within the provincial policy framework. Implementing this plan will engage many parties, providing opportunities to plan together, including for the private sector and residents. More than 100 municipalities across the Greater Golden Horseshoe will be updating their official plans and zoning bylaws to ensure they conform to the new growth plan. And together we'll be setting the stage for a dramatically new and better future for this growing region, for you here today. Now you may be sitting and thinking, why should I, my organization, or my company be involved in land use planning? Isn't that the government's job? Well, frankly, no. It's, it's all of our jobs. The private sector, builders, not-for-profits, consultants, lawyers, community groups, academics, we all have an important and constructive role in building the cities and regions of the future to help shape where and how we will grow and prosper. That topic of inclusiveness brings me to my second focus today, Ontario's land use planning appeals process, which our government believes isn't working as it was intended. The detailed work of land use planning is too frequently subject to appeal, resulting in costly hearings that delay needed projects. That's why I introduced legislation in May to overhaul the province's land use planning system, to give communities a stronger voice and ensure people have access to faster, fairer, and more affordable hearings. In her mandate letter to me last year, the Premier asked me to review the Ontario Municipal Board with my colleague, the Attorney General Yasser Nakfi. We launched this review in 2016, seeking input from Ontarians. About 700 people attended 12 town hall meetings across the province, and we received over 1,000 written submissions. The reform ideas presented in the consultations attracted strong but not unanimous support, but almost all felt the board could be improved. Under Bill 139, the Building Better Communities and Conserving Watersheds Act, if passed, we would replace the OMB with a new tribunal, the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal, or LPAT. Ontario would continue to have an appeal tribunal for land use planning to deal with planning matters across the province. But the proposed legislation, if passed, would give more weight to local and provincial decisions. It would eliminate appeals of provincially approved municipal official plans and major plan updates, and allow appeals of most major matters only based on whether decisions were aligned with provincial and municipal policies. The bill, if passed, would require mandatory case conferences for most Planning Act matters before cases could proceed to a hearing. This should help narrow the scope of the issues in the dispute. This bill, if passed, would also provide regulatory authority to introduce timelines for the tribunal, saving costs for all parties. And the OMB would be replaced by a true appeal body for major land use planning decisions, with a hearing process that is less adversarial. If passed, the proposed legislation would also give residents the tools they need to participate effectively in appeal hearings. By establishing the local uh, planning appeal support center to provide legal and planning resources to local residents and community groups. Mayor Tory is among the many municipal leaders who have voiced support for Bill 139. Mayor Tory said, and I quote, I believe these reforms move us in the direction that we want to go, which is more local responsibility for local planning decisions. And in speaking to municipal leaders, I know how supportive they are of this increased responsibility. The system we are proposing would still have accountability. It would give more weight to local decisions within a provincial framework. The Local Planning Appeal Tribunal would continue to hold municipalities and decision makers accountable. Land use planning decisions would be overturned by the tribunal if they found they don't conform or aren't consistent with provincial or municipal plans and policies. Official plans provide the framework for land use at the municipal level and they must be consistent with the provincial policy statement and conform to provincial plans. Bill 139's approach is consistent with our approach to the growth plan. The province sets out a strategic framework, but within that framework, democratically elected local councils are able to make decisions that work best for their communities. 
Getting the appeal process right will support growth and help us build communities that work for people. Without these reforms, we would continue to see appeals that negate municipal planning work, that prevent us from implementing provincial land use planning policies in a timely way, that hamper our ability to protect agricultural lands and natural areas, and that overturn community-based plans. Bill 139 passed second reading last month, and the Standing Committee on Social Policy uh, continues to review that bill, in fact, today. I mentioned the great urban planner, Patrick Geddes, uh, earlier in my remarks. One of his most famous quotes is, a city is more than a place in space, it is a drama in time. We want to retain our status as one of the best places to live, work, and invest in North America. As I mentioned earlier, today our prosperity is increasingly built on our highly educated workforce, our uniquely multicultural population, our social and economic diversity, all crucial to a knowledge-based economy. In a world of mobile talent and investment, we need to weight the balance in our favor, competing on more than economic factors alone. Quality of life is more important than ever. We'll only be able to achieve those objectives if our growth is smart and sustainable. That's what Ontario's land use planning policies are striving to achieve. We all need to have equally important roles in the drama in this time and in this place. That brings me to one last quote from a famous voice on cities and land use planning and someone who chose to make this region her home. Jane Jacobs wrote, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. I call on each of you to help us shape complete communities, starting in your neighborhood, in your ward, and in your town or city. Help us encourage smarter growth and build communities that work better for people. I thank you for your time today and I appreciate the invitation. <clears throat> Uh, Minister, thank you very much. Before I call upon Tim Hudak to thank you formally, I want to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VVC for live streaming today's event. If you want to learn more about our club, please visit us at CanadianClub.org. Mr. Hudak. <laughs> you enjoy this. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Nikki. Well, thanks very much, uh, Nikki. A, a great honor to uh, thank the Minister for his remarks as the CEO for the Ontario Real Estate Association. Uh, the minister uh, made a couple of jokes uh, up there, but I will say, you know, well, it's great to be up here on behalf of my team and I thanking the minister for his remarks. In some sense, I think the minister and his team should be up here thanking me and my team for four more years of job security. <laughs> there we go. Took a while for that one to get around the room. I, um, I do want to say my, uh, my incoming president, David Reed, is here. He's the uh, incoming head for Ontario Realtors. We had the drive down from Muskoka. So, David, great. Thank you for joining us and sponsoring the event today. I'll, um, I'll let you in on a bit of a secret. Sometimes politics is a bit like pro wrestling, just with less muscles and an angrier disposition. What I mean by that is you make a show for the cameras, but go out and have a coffee and beer and uh, get along quite well when the cameras turn off. And uh, Minister Morrow, in his capacity uh, as a legislator and as minister, has been tremendous to work with. We always got along quite well. I mean, quite frankly, I'll say to you, Bill, too, we saw your numbers in Thunder Basin. I'm not going to bother fighting that guy, so I might as well be his friend. <laughs> it might work out someday. The... Um, being a, making the choice of a Minister of Municipal Affairs is a very important and difficult job for the Premier. You're talking about somebody who's going to have to work with folks with a lot of type A personalities that may say one thing to your face and something else behind your back. They're all smarter than you and sometimes they're quick to run to the press and they disagree. No, sorry, that's running the PC and Liberal caucuses, not the Minister of Municipal Affairs. <laughs> But I, um, I remember what it was like to try to work with, with caucus, be leader. As Minister of Municipal Affairs, you've got 440 type A personalities that you work with. You've got to have a trusted and respected relationship with every mayor, chair, warden, reeve, councillor in the province. 
They've got to know when they go in to talk to you that you're going to be fair, thoughtful. You give them a fair shake, whether the big city, small town, or a northern community. And I think we would all agree that Minister Morrow's reputation as somebody who is thoughtful, down to earth, steady, has an open door, makes him incredibly well suited for this ministry. That has certainly been our experience, say David, as Ontario Realtors of the Minister, and my experience with him as a legislator over the years. I actually did lock up. Bill and I actually had no fights in the legislature over all those years together. I was trying to find some words I could throw back at him. We did have one dispute actually over, remember this, Bill, the Blandings, Blandings turtle. It was an endangered species in my riding. I was trying to get an environmental assessment, so I was arguing with them about that. But I will tell you today, I'm willing to throw that endangered species under the bus to get advancements for Ontario Realtors. <laughs> this is, um, but this is what I know uh, about Bill from experience and proven to be very true in my new capacity. I think you'll all agree. Um, the guy is a minister who has an open door. Uh, he has a good ear. He is fair, responsible, and he knows his files inside and out. He runs a strong team. You know, when Bill tells you something, that's what's going to happen. Minister Morrow, we appreciate all of your public service in the city of Thunder Bay, province of Ontario, and your stellar leadership as Minister of Municipal Affairs, and thank you for your remarks here today. Thank you very much.